feel like this is as ready as I'm ever going to be to talk about this subject. Not because I can't talk about it, but because I am scared I'm going to accidentally get something wrong. And that is what I'm trying to correct. Right now, over the last week, since last Monday, you have seen crazy stories in the news about my relatives and family in Mexico. You've seen it referred to as the LeBaron tragedy, the LeBaron attack. You've seen my family's name connected with cartels. You've seen them connected with sex cults. You've seen them collect connected to polygamy. You've seen them connected to the crazy black sheep people in my family from 50 years ago that have zero relevance today. And then amongst the truthful stories, there are some outrageous lies that just need to be debunked. That and also I have learned some very interesting interesting things about the media. I always knew the media was corrupt, but this has given me a whole new perspective on what our media is like and what they're willing to cover. So I am briefly in this podcast episode. It's probably going to be the longest episode I've ever recorded, but I do not want to shortchange this topic. It is very important to me and to family members that the truth is out there, um, that we set the record straight, and I'm doing my best today to do that. So I'm going to give you a short summary of what happened this time last week. I am going to talk to you about some of the media lies and debunking those, um, everything from sex colds, water issues, polygamy, all that. Um, and then I'm going to tell you what I learned about the media. Then we're going to end with a rapid fire Q&A for the many, 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 many of you who submitted questions on my Instagram channel um, about this. I will answer as many questions as I can. My name is Lisa Steele. This is Deconstructing the Culture. <music> All right, first thing first, this is not terribly important, but I am going to throw this out there because so many people have been asking me. I've been um, probably one of the top questions I've been getting is how am I related to the LeBarons? Um, So my maiden name is LeBaron. I am LeBaron through my father, Jordan through my mother. I married a man with the last name of Steele and I gladly took on his last name. So my maiden name is LeBaron. That's how that ties in. But speaking of the name LeBaron, some... (laughs) Something that I think is really disheartening to the families who did lose their immediate family members is the fact that LeBaron is the only name being used, and none of the victims had the last name of LeBaron. Yes, they were all related to LeBarons, and we're all kind of related. We're all kind of one big giant family, but I think it's very important that we honor the victims and honor their families and not just use the name LeBaron when that's not even their last name. It's just been what the media has been using specifically because of the negative connotations attached to that last name due to previous past history that's happened. I'll get into that later. Um, But the last names of the people who died is, it's important. The last names are Miller, Johnson, and Langford. Those are the last names, Miller, Johnson, and Langford of the three women and their children who died. Also, It is really important to me that I get all the facts 100% straight, and I have put dozens and dozens of hours over the last week, almost every second, it feels like it's slightly consumed my life, reading everything I can, listening to every single family group chat message that's come through, and talking to people who are much closer to the situation than I was this last week. I would like to specifically and very, with my deepest heartfelt gratitude, thank Tiffany Linkford and Kendra Lee Miller. Tiffany is um, very closely related to multiple of the victims, um, and Kendra Lee Miller is Juanita's sister-in-law, who is also down in Mexico when all this is happening. These two women have been completely invaluable. They have helped give me exactly the facts without any of the miscommunication or misinformation that's being spread, so I want to just just give the biggest thanks to these two women. I'm reading um, a lot of their words and their information that has confirmed what I already knew or corrected the record. So with that done, um, short summary of what happened this time last week on Monday. Basically, my Monday started like any other normal Monday. And then in the afternoon, um, probably roughly around one or two o'clock, I get this urgent message that's forwarded 
from a different group chat from one of my aunts into a family group chat that I'm part of. Also, um, the reason why group chats are so important to our family is because we are spread out over multiple countries. And instead of having international service for all of us, the main way that we stay connected with such large families and so spread out is WhatsApp group messages. So I'm personally part of multiple family group messages and I was getting multiple renditions and um, different forwarding. So that's how I was staying up to date, you know, every other minute watching this unfold and praying for my family. So my Monday and alertness to this came with the message, quote, we need all your prayers right now. There's a mafia war going on in La Mora right now. Nita and her four kids are dead. Two other women with their children are missing. They think they're being held hostage. That's how my Monday started. It made my heart utterly stop. It made me feel sick. I I didn't feel like I could believe it at first. I felt like maybe it was a mistake. Maybe they weren't dead. Maybe it was someone else's car. Maybe they weren't in the car. Maybe something. I just I just wanted to find any reason to think that this wasn't the case. Um, as far as my relation, that's been a, a, a big question I've been getting, how my relation to the victims. Um, Ronita is my second cousin um, through my father's side. My second cousin once removed on my mother's side. Um, and then Donna and Christina are my cousins through marriage. So the next message I got was, um, said two o'clock Arizona time, everyone please drop what you're doing, gather up your family and kneel in prayer. Let's offer up as many prayers as we possibly can. Prayer is so powerful. Share this on all your chats. Because again, group chats are very important to my family. This is something that I, within minutes, as you can tell, we're all very closely connected. I'm seeing this all over my social media all a ton and ton of my family members are immediately as soon as they're seeing this they're posting this message taking screenshots and posting this message and so i'm getting it from dozens of different sides and that's what everyone did we desperately brought, dropped to our knees and prayed because we believe in the power of prayer then um the play-by-play -play was really really agonizing over the next few hours hearing directly messages from the immediate family members and they're breaking down and crying it was it felt like more than you could really bear the first video that we received was from grandfather to nita's children four children who were born burned in their vehicle and it broke your heart because you hear his voice and what a lot of media haven't noticed is media the media generally doesn't post bloody or gory pictures or videos they blur that out but the media wasn't looking very carefully when they reshared and reposted this video showing Nita's burned vehicle because that that video was taken before the victims were removed and you can see if you look closely and you pause here in just a second I'm going to share that video so if you can't stomach it I would skip it but if you look at this video closely and you press pause you will see on YouTube, you can see Neva's legs in the, in the driver's seat. You can see her bones. You can see a child's rib cage on the passenger side floor. Their bodies are still there, and that is all that is left because it was so hot. So I'm going to show that video really quickly and then give you a brief summary. This is for the record. Nita and four of my grandchildren are burnt and shot up. Right on the road out of La Mora. That video, it hurts. I don't, you don't even have to be family to feel the hurt, to feel the pain. That is just utterly past heartbreaking. Um, so, brief summary of what happened. On the morning of November 4th, 2019, three mothers and their three vehicles with 14 children between them set out from La Mora, a small farming community in the mountains of northeastern Sonora. So that is also a correction I would like to make. A lot of media saying that this happened in La Baron or Colonial La Baron. This didn't happen in Chihuahua at all. It happened in Sonora, specifically about 10 miles or 10 minutes outside of um, La Mora. So, 
two of them, two of the women to see family in Chihuahua, one of them to pick up her husband from the airport in Phoenix, Arizona. They never made it. They were ambushed by the Mexican cartels, shot, burned, and murdered in cold blood. They were innocent civilians and American citizens simply trying to live peaceful lives. For 11 hours, the families all over Sonora, Chihuahua, and the Midwestern United States waited in fear and horror for any news of the possible survivors. I would also add to this, waited, you know, I'm on the East Coast, and it was constant prayers all day waiting to, to just praying that the other women and their children were alive. The first vehicle was found full of bullet holes and completely ablaze. Nita and her four of her seven children she had taken on the trip, they were burned mostly to ash and only a few charred bones left to identify that all five had been inside. It appeared that one had tried to escape as the front passenger door was open and the remains were partially in and out of the vehicle. Those would have been, um, that's what you would have seen in the video uh, if you press pause and looked at that closely. On another part of the road, about roughly 10 miles ahead, were Christina and her baby Faith in her vehicle and Donna with her nine children and hers. Donna has 13 children, I, I want to clarify. These are nine of her children with her. They both were fired upon from ahead and Christina jumped out, waving her arms to let the attackers know that it was women and children in the vehicles. She gave her life to try and save the rest. Donna and two of her boys were also killed in the gunfire. Um, I have been hearing from family and also watched a video of uh, Donna's oldest son with her saying that her last words were telling her children to get down, to duck down. She died a hero trying to save her children, trying to protect her babies. Um, it's also um, been said by her oldest, who was reporting and, and talking about this story, that uh, they must have hit the engine very, very early on or something in Donna's vehicle because she kept trying to start the car and get it to go forward and get out of there, and she couldn't. And that's why she had enough time to yell to her children to get down, get down, and then then she was killed. After witnessing his mother and brothers being shot and being killed, Donna's son, Devin, who was 13 years old, hid six of his siblings in the bushes and covered them with branches to keep them safe while he went for help. Again, something else that I have recently watched um, Donna explaining on video, or excuse me, Donna's son, Devin, explaining on video what happened. He said that after his mom and his two brothers were shot and killed, the men who were shooting at them with very long guns came down, saw that they were all children, made them all get out of the car, all these injured babies and children get out of the car, had them lay down on the ground, and then they told them to get out of here. And the cartel left, and that's when Devin struggled to get them away from the accident, or not the accident, get them away from the, the slaughter that had just happened and, and hide them in bushes. Um, from there, um, after Devin hid his um, six other siblings in the bushes and covered them with branches to keep them safe, he took a long time to return, but he had to walk over 14 miles to go get help. So in the meantime, thinking that it was taking too long, his nine-year-old sister left the remaining five to try again. Devin arrived in La Mora at 5.30 p.m., six hours after the ambush. You have to imagine six agonizing hours. Nobody knew. It, everyone was praying like crazy, including myself, praying that Donna and Christina and their kids would be okay. And for six hours, we had no idea. And then I just remember getting the messages <laughs> saying, the, the, some of the kids are alive. They're hiding in bushes. That's all we know. Literally, they came in. They, they were yelling. They told us what happened. And they jumped in their car with, with guns or jumped in their trucks with guns and left. Um, so after six hours, he gave the first news to anyone of what happened to Donna and Christina's families. Devin's uncles armed themselves with guns and returned to try and find the hidden children, knowing many of them were injured, and they didn't get far before realizing they would be risking death since they'd been, since there had been continual shooting for hours all over the mountains near La Mora. The group of men waited for a while for reinforcements. I'm going to pause right there. Listening to the messages this one particular broke my heart. One of the men who's very um, close to the situation literally said, we realize we can't go up there right now, not without reinforcements, and our poor babies are gonna be traumatized for another 45 minutes to an hour. We can't go get them. He was crying, and you can hear him. He's saying, 
we realize if we go up there now without reinforcements and these men get shot, that there'll be 70 children without fathers and we can't do that. And so he's literally devastated that he can't run and rescue these babies. It's the most heartbreaking thing to listen to in our family chats. Around 7.30, um, they finally found the hidden children. Um, thanks to Devin. Devin is a hero. I cannot believe just how strong and tough and brave that this young man is. The group of men then, um, after, after finding the, the children hidden in the bushes, um, minus um, the little nine-year-old girl who went looking after her brother took too long, they actually found, they finally were able to approach Donna and Christina's vehicles, and they found baby Faith, Christina's baby that was with her in the vehicle and miraculously is literally a miracle but baby faith survived and it looks as though her mom tried to save her life before getting out of the car and waving her arms to say stop there's women and children in here she um the baby even though baby faith was in her car seat and there were bullet holes in her car seat and all around in the vehicle miraculously baby faith was completely unharmed but she also was alone for hours and hours um, in the vehicle alone because nobody knew that she was alive. We all thought that she was dead. Um, somehow she just, she survived. And that's, I, I believe that that's nothing but a miracle from God. Um, so then of course, after they retrieved baby Faith and the other children hid in the bushes, bushes they had to go find nine-year-old Mackenzie, who's also just such a sweetheart and a hero. You can tell she just, all she cares about is keeping her family and her, her little siblings safe um, because she had gone for help but had taken the wrong road and went missing. So soldiers who had arrived by then and the men of La Mora were, um, and nearby towns were searching for two hours in the dark until they found her around 9.30 p.m. Um, they found her because they could see her distinctive footprint because she had one, she'd had one shoe missing and the other shoe on and her foot was her feet were so bloodied and blistered she could barely walk and um and so thank goodness that was another miracle finding her in the dark and in the mountains um the five of donna's children who were injured were picked up by a waiting ambulance and treated at a local hospital until a hot helicopter sent by the mexican military came to pick them up their father david who had then arrived from Arizona accompanied them to be life flighted to another helicopter who that was waiting at the U.S. border and from there was transferred to Phoenix for further treatment. Devin, his brother Jake, and Christina's baby Faith were all uninjured and are in the care of their family members. Um, at you know at this point um, in the story, and at the end of the day, what we knew by about 10 o'clock is that we had confirmed nine dead in our family. Um, and it was desperate. I cannot, I can't fully explain to you how basically everyone in my family is thinking nine of our family are dead in a place where we've previously not had issues and felt safe for a long time. Um, it's not safe and we don't know what to do and there will never be justice and we won't have help because sure, we've got Mexican military here right now but the Mexican police notoriously don't help they don't do anything we, we can't count on justice because in the Mexican police and in military and government you don't know who's mafia and who's not or who's being heavily paid off so at this point we are thinking we need to cry and scream and shout for justice this needs to be shared this needs to go Everywhere, everyone needs to know about this. These are American citizens um, who have dual citizenship in both America and in Mexico. And it's just all of my family are literally posting, 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 trying to bring awareness to this. And I want to give each and every one of you who both shared this information from my page and other people's pages and also alerted your local media because we couldn't have done it without you. We needed a spotlight shown on this. And thank you. Thank you to those who helped make that possible. Um, uh, basically what it came down to is Juanita Miller, um, she was 30 years old, confirmed dead, and her four children, Howard, 12 years old, Crystal, 10 years old, and her twin babies, Titus and Tina, who are both eight months old, 
all confirmed dead and burned in their vehicle. Um, of what's left of that family is the father um, and husband, Howard, who was in North Dakota at the time of the attack, and the three siblings left behind in Lamora, who were being babysat by the Miller grandparents, Tristan, Amrilius, and Zach. And now those, those three babies are motherless, and they have lost four siblings. And they have a father who's now lost four of his babies and his wife. He's a widower. Um, and the other household, Christina uh, Lingford Johnson, she was just a few days away from turning 32. Her birthday is this month. Um, then survived is her baby that was with her, Faith, who's seven months old. And she was found with the bullets in her car seat, and she was miraculously uninjured. Um, and uh, also, and she's also left behind a, a husband and grieving children. Um, dead are Donna Lankford, who was 43 years old, Trevor, who was 11 years old, Rogan, who was two and a half years old. They were all killed and left in the vehicle. And um, survived was Kylie, who was 14 years old. She was shot in the foot. Devin, 13 years old, was uninjured and had to walk the 14 miles to Lamora to get help after hiding his siblings in the bushes. Mackenzie, nine years old, oh, she had a graze on her arm. Um, she was the one who was sent for help and uh, got lost and had to be found. She walked 10 miles um, for about four hours in the dark before she was found. Um, Cody, who was eight years old, he was shot, oh, just so tragically. He was shot in the jaw and the leg and his condition is very worrying. He is still currently in the hospital um, and he is uh, just undergoing some serious surgeries and recovery. Jake Lankford, he's age six, he's uninjured. Um, Alexander, he's four, he was shot in the back. And Braxton Lankford, um, almost nine months old, he was shot in the chest, open flesh wound, and a bullet graze on the wrist. That is a brief history of what happened. If you have heard or seen any other crazy virgin versions of this, um, I'm gonna get to some of those exaggerations, but even big figures like Glenn Beck and Ben Shapiro got some facts very exaggerated slash wrong. We'll talk about that. Um, now we're going to go ahead and answer some of the most common questions with some in-depth answers because yeah, that's, there are some pretty crazy, pretty crazy stories going on out there. So I'm going to go ahead and answer some of the main questions. Like I said, a lot of this information has been directly relayed to me through family chats and also from close family members, um, specifically Tiffany and Kendra. So one of the main questions that is being asked, number one question I'd say is, did the mafia target and kill these people on purpose? Um, or was it simply just a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time? Because that's what the Mexican government is saying, is the wrong place, wrong time. Oh, it's so sad, but it wasn't on purpose. Um, and also, was anyone shot point blank or was it a mistaken identity from a far distance away? So what um, the information that we have from family and um, just keep in mind also that there, I'm gonna tell you a lot of I don't knows as well because we don't fully know 100%. We don't know motive. We don't know why this happened. Um, but basically the family currently believes that this is not an accident. They believe that the family was targeted, although we don't know why. It's very much under speculation. According to the surviving victims, who are the children, who are the only witnesses. The mafia knew it was women and children and killed them anyways. Um, if you look at the evidence, there were shells up close around Nita's vehicle. Nita is the one who was burned in her vehicle with her four children. So that means that they did start from a distance away and then got closer after and fired more rounds closer. Um, also, the, the, the media was falsely reporting that the vehicle burst into flame due to a uh, you know, a bullet going into the wrong spot. Um, but they're, they're saying, family members are saying they do not think that's the case. They think it was purposely set on fire. The reason being um, is because Christina, first of all, a um, different vehicle, but Christina was found shot outside her vehicle and they believe that to have been point blank. 
and there are bullets on top of some of the vehicles, so that would assume that they that some of them were from a bit of a distance away as well. But specifically, the reason why they think Nia's vehicle was set on fire, not accidentally burst into flame, is because they found items that should not have survived a fire outside their vehicle a ways away, for instance, her pocketbook. So they think that they, um, the cartel came up, rifled through Nita's stuff, looked through her wallet, and then purposely set the car ablaze. The question is, is obviously after that, why? We don't know. Why set those cars on fire and not the other two on fire? We don't know. That's the answer. Um, anyone that tells you that they know the answer or the media is speculating a lot, don't believe it. They don't, we don't know. We just don't know. Trust me, we wish that we do. Um, the best theory that we have from all the clues gathered is that first, Ronita's vehicle was shot from somewhere at a distance, then they came close and shot her and her children point blank to make sure they were dead before they took her purse and pocket, you know, like I said, her pocketbook was found a ways away from the car and then set fire to her vehicle to burn the evidence. Um, another question that I'm getting a lot and many people are asking is, um, why are people living there if it's not safe? Was it safe before? What, is this an ongoing issue where people weren't safe? Or is this like completely out of the blue? The answer is yes and no. The answer is no, this kind of violence was completely unprecedented. It was a complete shock. Nobody saw it coming. But yes, there were some signs of some potential danger. For instance, um, you know, Tiffany was telling me that growing up, she rarely ever worried about the mafia going to La Moda, but it's been in the, the past recent years that has become more of a concern. There have been car chases. Soldiers will sometimes stop you and check your vehicle. Another reason why people try to never go over the road without a man is for that, is they, they want that male protection. Um, they're never really sure when they're going back and forth and being stopped if soldiers are actually so soldiers or mafia, because like I said, they're usually sometimes one in the same or back and forth. Recently, there's been a couple of instances where no one was hurt or property damaged, but people have been a lot more cautious. Still, no one ever thought that this would have ever happen. Um, they also tried to make a point um, because this is a well-traveled road by my family members who live in La Mora. They travel this, you know, they've traveled it probably for like the last 50 years. Um, so they try not to travel at night. People do it sometimes and they haven't had issues, but they're just, at a, you know, it's it kind of basically you try not to. Um, a lot apparently has been happening in the last couple of months. If, according to Kendra, if the cartel didn't recognize a vehicle coming into the valley, they'd surround it and point guns in faces until they realized who it was. Then they'd apologize and say, go on. At that point, the cartel in the valley was just mostly trying to sell drugs and get more money. But one of the ways that they were doing this was threatening those, um, threatening those people who lived there saying that they were no longer able to go over that mountain um, to buy their own gas. Um, that the people in their towns who sold gas were no longer able to do that for threat of their lives. They're, the mafia was saying you're no longer allowed to buy gas and bring it here and sell it. Two people from around that area disappeared a few months ago and were never seen again on a trip over to buy some gas. Um, they still apparently let family members go buy diesel, but one of the men in that community stopped after leaving the gas station with his two barrels um, because a man holding an AR-15 um, told that he wasn't going to be leaving unless he paid basically a corrupt tax. Like, we're not, you're, not, you're not taking this gas that you just paid for. You have to pay a tax on it to me. It's a very, very corrupt system. Um, some of the speculations that you'll see, which do have some truth, is that the legalization of marijuana has hurt the drug cartels, and they're trying to find other ways to make up their revenue um, that they used to make from that. So um, another crazy question, but I feel like I have to answer it because it's being asked so much, is we're any of my family members, any of these families, were they involved with the cartels at all? The answer to that is absolutely no. Absolutely no. There is absolutely no truth to any people in La Mora being involved in the cartel whatsoever. It's just awful, awful that anyone, and especially in the media, would try to bring this up and say that this is the case and that it's victim blaming saying, hey, you deserve this because you're involved. First of all, there was no involvement and also nobody deserves this kind of death, especially not women and children, defenseless women and children. Um, 
I have heard some crazy stories on my Instagram of people saying that they're water stealing issues, um, some nonsense like that. That's totally made up, crazy story. That's not the case at all. Um, especially because the people in that community, which is rather on the smaller end, they really made a point to treat the locals with respect and to help them prosper. Definitely not to steal from them. That's a crazy, just ludicrous, made up lie. I don't even know where that came from, but for some reason, some, some rando has been saying that and posting that a lot on a lot of my posts, but that's crazy. If you've seen that, no, that's total made up junk. Um, so a lot of people have been asking where were these women going, why were they traveling together, and where were their husbands? So you'll have caught in the story, their husbands were in various places, um, you know, in North Dakota for one of them. So Nita was going to Arizona to pick up her husband, Howard. Um, he was actually flying from North Dakota to come to La Mora for um, Kendra Miller's wedding, and I just... I mean, my heart just goes out because Kendra Miller, um, not only did she lose very close family members, her sister-in-law and her nieces and nephews, but her wedding was supposed to be today, November 11th. She's supposed to be getting married to the love of her life. And instead she's grieving, grieving so deeply over her lost family members and taking care of her, her little baby nieces and nephews and not getting married to the love of her life. I mean, it's just an awful turn of events. Um, one of the messages that was forwarded from Kendra, she was keeping us up to date on what was going on because she was down there. You can hear in the background, um, you can hear in the background, she's giving an update. And one of the kids, I don't know who, but one of the kids is saying like, so-and-so got my mommy, got my mommy. Um, just, it really breaks your heart. Um, but to finish answering the question, Christina was going to Colonial LeBaron, which is about five hours away. And um, you take that mountain pass, but it's roughly about five hours away. Um, and like I said earlier, a lot of the media has been reporting that all this happened in Colonial LeBaron. That's not the case. This happened in Sonora, La Mora, Mexico. Um, but Christina was going to LeBaron to meet with the rest of her kids and her husband, and they were actually going to move to North Dakota together. So this was like one of her last trips down, and it was her very last trip because now she's not moving to North Dakota. She's, she's with Jesus. Um, Donna LeBaron was going to visit family for a few days in LeBaron as well. Um, a lot of our families, um, you know, have married each other. And so you know, a lot of the family in La Mora are also related to the LeBarons. Um, so Basically, why were they traveling together is a lot of people just for safety and numbers and accountability. They, um, and spotty service, also a cell phone service, they like to try and travel together for safety just in case someone, you know, maybe breaks down or um, gets a flat tire, which actually happened to Nina earlier in that day. Um, you know, the fact is, is there's not really police or towns nearby. There's no safety or people looking out for them. And, um, unfortunately that was the case and so that's why they were traveling together and and that didn't protect them this time um now what happened to these vehicles how were they discovered one of the questions i'm getting is who saw the car fire how was this originally discovered so andre who is brother to nita um, whose vehicle was burned with her and her children in it um, Andre and another um, friend they saw the explosion from a distance and at first they thought it was just like maybe a Mexican campfire, one of the, you know, cartels campfires, but then they saw an explosion and they're like, what is this? So they ran over and they realized it was, it, Andre realized it was his mom's vehicle who he knew his sister-in-law, Nita, was driving and he, it was such a huge fire, he couldn't tell who was in it or if anyone was in it. So he was at that point hoping, praying, thinking maybe Nita and her kids were out and then the car set on fire and maybe Nita was trying to walk home or something, but they didn't know until later when the fire simmered down that Nita and her babies were all in there and dead. Um, so that's when Andre um, he ran to go tell his family what happened and they came back with Andre's dad. Uh, that would be Nita's father-in-law. Um, and that just, it was absolutely unthinkable but um that after that point because um a lot of people in the mexican government have been trying to say oh, it was a mexican crossfire both sides were firing at each other they got stuck in the middle of it they're saying from the very beginning uh, family is saying from the very beginning that is not the case absolutely because there was only one side and they don't know what side they're guessing it was a Ch chihuahua side came into sonora and shot at them and then after the sonora side 
their mafia showed up to the scene trying to figure out what happened. They're like, what's going on? And uh, apparently it, they started working themselves up into a fight after this because for the next several hours they heard gunshots. So they, they believe that both of the cars, cartels at that point begin to fire back and forth at each other. But there was no getting stuck in the crossfire, which is what your, your media is going to tell you in, in a lot of places. Um, after 13-year-old Devin made it back home and he told them what had happened the, um, to the other two vehicles and the children, the men on the farm were really, really concerned because, of course, they're going to want to run and rescue their children up in the mountains um, and, and get those surviving kids. But at the same time, um, they're, they're leaving all their women and children locked in their houses saying, don't, don't go anywhere. We don't know what's going on. This is not safe. People are, are dead. And they had to wait for reinforcements until they got there to um, help them go up there um, and and be able to rescue the other children without risking leaving, you know, dozens of kids fatherless. Um, so then another question is, why are these people living in Mexico in the first place? And how many people are leaving their homes in La Mora now because of this? Um, so now, why, you know, how many people are leaving their homes in La Mora? From last I saw, um, watching family members post videos and updates. Um, there was a huge caravan of vehicles leaving La Mora a couple days ago after the last funeral. Um, as far as I've been hearing, there's basically a ghost town in La Mora right now, and a lot, a lot of people have left. Um, a few people have kind of stayed for now, but basically no one feels safe there anymore, and I really can't blame them. They just are not safe anymore. Not only did they lose their family members and... Um, their sense of safety, but now they have to leave their homes. They have to completely leave their, you know, their beautiful ranches and big homes and and um, and farms, their livelihoods, and have to completely uproot overnight. And it's not like they're getting U-Hauls down there and bring them to the United States of America. I mean, it's literally them packing whatever they can, you know, pictures, photos, clothes, packing whatever they can into their trucks and SUVs and leaving because they just have to be safe again and they just, they can't stay there, not after this has happened to their families. Now, why were they living there in the first place? Um, without going into too much of a crazy detail, essentially um, these, uh, quite a few colonies were, were built down there. Um, there's been a lot of coverage trying to connect everything to the Mormon church. Um, to be honest with you, these are not Mormon colonies. I mean, they might have been originally founded that way, you know, 50 to 80 years ago. Um, but people live down there because that's their livelihood now. That's where their farms are. That's where they've been born and raised. I was born in Colonial LeBaron. I have a lot of family still who live down there because that's their home. Um, you know, it's like, why do people in Chicago live there when Chicago is a really dang dangerous city that doesn't allow you to own guns? Or why do you live in New York if New York, parts of New York are very dangerous and don't allow you to carry guns? Like it's basically to me, it's very similar. And it, usually the answer is going to be because this is our home, because this is where we're born and raised. This is where our family is. So that's their home. Yes, they have dual citizenship. They're Americans. They're living in Mexico, but these have been their homes for a long time. Many, many of them were born there or raising their children their children have been born there and that's why they're living there a lot of people have asked me like are there missionaries are they missionaries there no they're not missionaries there they're just American citizens living in there um, you know from so many people who have been born and raised or just raised their own kids there it's a kid's paradise full of places for their kids to you know just be kids and um, you know up until this terrible tragedy it was a really divine beautiful paradise to, to raise kids who are outdoors, um, outdoors kids, and, and um, yeah, it's just, it's really, it really stinks, it, I mean, it's, it, that's an under, understatement of the year to say it stinks, but um, it's just really tragic, because they're now being forced to leave their homes, too. Um, so, why are they there? So, um, before I go into that, and then I'm also going to give you an update on the funerals, the kids' health, what I've learned about the media um, and their narrative, and how they will not cover the gun story. Um, also, then I'm going to answer rapid fire Q&A, and I'm going to talk about the negative history that the media is constantly leaking, linking to this. Before I do that, I'm going to ask you to please subscribe and review. Um, please at least subscribe and share this. I'm going to ask you specifically for this episode, please share this episode because this has been a nationwide story. President Donald Trump 
on Tuesday tweeted about my family and tweeted about what happened. He said, um, on Tuesday morning, a wonderful family and friends from Utah got caught between two vicious drug cartels who were shooting at each other, with the result being many great American people killed, including young children and some missing, the president posted. If Mexico needs our help or request, request help in cleaning out these monsters, the United States stands ready and willing and able to get involved and to do the job quickly and effectively. Trump continued, the new or the great new president of Mexico has made this a big issue, but the cartels have become so large and powerful, you sometimes need an army to defend or to defeat an army. This is time for Mexico with the help of the United States to wage war on the drug cartels and wipe them off the face of the earth, the president concluded. We merely await a call from your great new president. Now, the president of Mexico unfortunately said, no, we're not going to get your help with this. I think that they're really embarrassed. They tried to come up with a story. Um, a day after this saying that they caught the people who did this and it was two men in Arizona with um, two hostages in their car which were not related to us at all and then they later of course admitted oh no this actually has nothing to do with happened um, to the LeBaron family as they're calling it but we know that they're Johnson Miller and Lankford um, women and children but the truth is, is this has been a worldwide news story and if you can imagine just knowing the little bit of misinformation you knew before hearing this podcast, can you imagine there's the rest of the world that doesn't know the true story too? So I'm going to ask you to please, please, anyone who you know who's been following the story, please share this podcast with them. It really is important. All right. So um, let me go ahead and continue um, a quick update. They held funerals um, for all of the victims. They buried Donna and her two boys in, um, in La Mora. And then, um, and then they ended up burying Nila and her twins with her in her coffin, and then her two other children um, in Colonial LeBaron, and then they also buried Christina in Colonial LeBaron. So they ended up having a whole ton of Mexican police and um, Mexican uh, just government troops. Um, army come in and escort a huge caravan, car ooh, excuse me, caravan of vehicles all the way from La Mora to Colonial Le Baron because they weren't safe. And they all had to travel that same road to get from one place to the other to go and bury their loved ones. Um, some people have asked me, why aren't you, why, why, why weren't these people buried in America? Well, first of all, I'm just going to say this is not coming from anyone except me, but I'm going to just say just off the top of my head, that seems very difficult. It's very difficult in the first place to get bodies from one country to another. I mean, it's hard to get them from state to state, but from one country to another is difficult. Also, these are their loved ones, and this is, these are their homes where they've been born and raised in both um, La Mora and Colonia Le Baron. And so this is their home. You would want your loved ones buried in your home too, where you had history and where your loved ones are from. So um, five of the eight children that survived this attack, they had to go to the hospital. Now four of those five children that were in the hospital have been able to go home. The only one left in the hospital is little Cody. Um, he's going to be there for a little while because of his jaw injury. His jaw has been wired shut for at least a couple of weeks, maybe longer. And he was told I was told in a group chat, and this broke my heart. I started crying when I first read this message that he cried. And he cried for hours silently because his jaw is wired shut and he can't talk. Not with it wired shut like this. And he cried for hours, just grief stricken and confused, and he can't talk. So just extra prayers for the whole family, but especially for Cody. He's definitely still in the hospital. I think he has um, quite a road of recovery in front of him. This will probably affect him for the rest of his life, physically and everyone, emotionally and spiritually. Yeah, so please, please pray for them. Um, a little bit of an update now um, on how the media has covered it. 
Now, I just want to say that how the media has covered it at first was just the story, and then it got disgusting. So I told you I was going to tell you about the history of why these towns um, were founded and why everyone's calling it a Mormon colony. I just want to point out this is not a Mormon colony. Um, not everyone there is Mormon. Um, it's just, I don't... They just like to do that because it makes the story more, more sensational. Um, many, many there, and basically all of them have a Mormon background um, and maybe even a Mormon beliefs, but only a small number of the members or of the people there are actually members of the LDS church and would be part of the Mormon church. Um, they're also not a polygamous group, okay? Um, very not a polygamous group, and there's a very, even a small, tiny fraction that actually still practice polygamy. Now, how polygamy comes in is without, this is a whole episode all by itself, so without going into a long, long, long story, basically about like 50 years ago, my great uncle, so it's my father's uncle. Um, my father's uncle, his name was Herbal LeBaron. You can look him up if you want. It's pretty awful. But basically, he's a crazy black sheep of the family, and he was very mentally unstable and got super, super evil and decided to like call himself like the patriarch of a church. And he was like the one mighty and strong. And then he started um, any of his family and friends who didn't believe that he was the one mighty and strong. He ordered his followers to kill them. So he killed his brother, Joel. He killed one of his daughters and his unborn grandbaby. Um, he unfortunately killed a rival, um, not really a rival, but another polygamous leader, um, an all red in Utah. Um, some really terrible things happened. But my point in bringing this up, I would not bring this up ever. I really wouldn't bring this up because this has nothing to do with the LeBarons or the Lankfords or the Millards or the Johnsons who live in Lamora and LeBaron today. It, they just really don't. No one believes in that. No one's holding on to that. That's just a crazy, awful thing that happened 50 years ago. Um, you know, he even, he actually even ordered his, um, his kids to kill my grandfather, my mom's dad, and he did successfully murder my mom's dad. Or, or his followers murdered my mom's dad when um, when my mom was a little girl. So yeah, it's definitely a history bit there, but has nothing to do with this story today. And it has nothing to do with the people who are currently living in these communities. And the only reason why the media brought this in is for their own gain. They wanted to sensationalize it, make it a bigger story. I mean, it's a, it's a, women and children being killed by the cartel. That's already a disgustingly disturbing, sad, tragic story. And of course, the media had to make it even worse. They wanted to make it even worse, and they had to drag in the black sheep person of the family that happened and embarrassed everybody and did terrible things and terrorized people, mostly his own family, not even like other random people. He mostly terrorized his own family. And of course, they're bringing in Irva LeBaron because it gives them a chance to sell more, more stories or more clickbait or whatever the heck it is. So you know, sure, you can, you can go read the books about my family on that story. I'm not telling you shouldn't. I've read as many as I can get my hands on to fully understand, you know, what happened in my family's history a long time ago, but he's a great uncle for many of these people far removed or not, or some of these people not related at all except through marriage. And he's just a black sheep, crazy person that happened 50 years ago. And if any time anything happened to your family, so let's just say, I know this is terrible, but Let's just say, you remember when the Florida shooting at the school shooting happened, um, you know, what, last summer, last spring? What if every victim, they took every victim, every child who died in that, and then they dug up dirt, just gross dirt that happened in their family that's not related to that child or their family or their parents, but they just found some great uncle or some random the person from 50 years ago and then found dirt on every single victim, you would be disgusted. You'd be like, these families are suffering. These families are traumatized. These families just lost their mother. These families just lost their wife. This, I mean, you would be like, what the heck is wrong with you? They just died in a school shooting and all you can do is dig into each family's past and find the disgusting, you know, mean-spirited bad things that ever happened in their family like bad things happen in everyone's family I'll bet you if you look you look back in your family's past hard enough you can probably find a, a racist or you can probably find a murderer or someone went to jail for something you're gonna find a bad person in your hat in your past or in your family's past because that's how every family is unfortunately 
more than most families in America, my family's been covered a lot. And I think it's really unjust to the families to our, who are Miller, again, they're Millers, Langfords, and Johnsons, to connect them with the LeBarons and then go so far as to try and connect them to Herbal LeBaron from 50 years ago, who's not even related to some of these people, or is Disney, I mean, that's not connected. No one is part of his church, okay? And yeah, some people live polygamy still, but that doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. The only one of the victims who practiced polygamy is Donna was a plural wife. Donna who, it was Donna and her two boys who died. And then um, she has not, you know, her other um, seven children survived it. But the truth is, is that shouldn't matter. If Donna Miller being a plural wife matters, then where is your humanity? Because it shouldn't matter. And you know what? If this had happened in some really atheist, secular culture, the media wouldn't have covered this story and been like, these people died. And they come from a culture where a lot of people don't believe in God and they don't read the Bible and they're just super secular. No, the media would never cover that. But then of course they're gonna take people's religious beliefs, which I'm not defending polygamy. I'm not saying it's right, okay? I'm not a defender of polygamy. I'm not gonna make excuses for it. Um, I don't think that it's God's way. You know, my own mother, um, you know, was married to a polygamist when I was young. That's how I'm a product of polygamy. But the truth is, is that shouldn't matter. In this kind of trauma, in this kind of tragedy, that should not matter, okay? Innocent women and children were killed. And I'm just going to be honest on a personal level. And it really, I mean, it just, I'm just, I'm not even, I'm not even going to search and put these titles aside. I'm just going to look up. I'm going to type in LeBaron. I'm going to tell you some of these news articles on my phone, okay? LeBaron Community was founded as a sanctuary for polygamy. What? What? Why does that matter? Every town had some random founding. Why are you tying it to polygamy? These are just innocent children and women who are died, and then you've got to bring in this? Give me a break. Um, here we go. Um, Mexico Massacre spotlights Mormon community with deep roots. Also, I do have to say, I really feel bad for the Mormons. They have been trying super hard to the point where this last year, the Mormon church came out and said, we're no longer going to be called the Mormon church. Do not refer to yourselves or others as Mormons. They changed names. It's no longer the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. They're trying so hard to get away from this. They're trying so hard to get away from polygamy. And then here the media comes and does a complete like image decimation. It's, I mean, it's sad. For, I feel bad for the Mormons. Um, just so you know, anyone who currently practices polygamy, they are not a part of the traditional Mormon church that exists today, in case you were confused. Now, here we go. Here are some others. Oh, slay, this is from NBC News. Slaying U.S. citizens were part of a Mormon offshoot with oh, a storied history. Oh, what to know about the Mormon community in Mexico following ambush attack? And it's about polygamy. Oh, um, how about how Nixvim and the Mormon church are connected to the LeBaron family murderers? That's total, total lies. Um, Mormons in Mexico, a history of polygamy, cartel violence, and faith. What? Uh, the dark secrets of the LeBaron family tree, polygamous shocking murders, and drug cartel links. No, we're not linked to the drug cartels. We're, most of the community is not polygamous, only a very small fraction still practice that. And no, we don't have a history of violence. Just because one crazy person 50 years ago did some things, you don't get to say the whole family's connected to uh, violence. We're not violent, okay? So it just made me sick in the way they were covering this. And it, it really came across as victim blaming. It really was just disgusting. They're not in it to give you the truth. They're not in it to set the record straight. They're in it to sell stories. And if bringing in a random family member from a few years ago and, and casting it on the family like it's their fault is how they're going to sell more newspapers, then that's what they're going to do. So, um, you know, like I said, it's not, a, it's not a Mormon community. Some people have Mormon beliefs, but it's not a Mormon community. Um, just like any city. You can't call a city a Mormon city because a couple of people in it have Mormon beliefs. Like, that's not the way it works. Um, a couple of corrections. We are not connected to a sex cult in any way. I feel like I've said this a million times on Instagram, but I keep getting the question. We are not connected to any kind of Jeffrey Epstein or sex cult. That's completely crazy. No one had even heard about this until the media made up some story and then us were like, we're shaking our heads, scratching our heads, like, what the heck is this? Total, total lies. We're nothing to do with it. Um, 
you know, as Tiffany put it, she says, I lived my whole life knowing my dad, grandpa, and uncles, and all the men in our town didn't believe that they have had the authority to ha even have a community Sunday school, much less start their own churches or cults. Um, but, you know, everyone believes how they, how they want. There's no, like, there's no cult going on down there. Not anymore. I mean, there might have been a long time ago with Ervil, but that's, that's dead in the past. Ervil's been dead a long time. He died in prison, okay? Um, yeah. Herbal LeBaron has nothing to do with La Mora or the victims there, um, or even LeBaron at this point. That's just long gone and past. Um, even Glenn Beck and Ben Shapiro got some things wrong, which I thought was interesting. I really, really wanted to believe that they would get the story right, but even then, they got some facts really kind of skewed and exaggerated, and I'm just like, there are a lot of family members out there with the truth. You could have just easily fact-checked it, so that was a little disappointing because as someone who has a, a great respect for both of those men, I was disappointed that they had some, like, for instance, one of the things that they said that they got wrong in their stories, they said that, um, that women were possibly raped. I don't know where the heck that came from. No one was raped. Um, for a minute, you know, in those six hours when we didn't know where Christina or Donna were, we thought that maybe that they had been kidnapped, but no one said anything about raped. And then Glenn and Ben came out with this story the next day after we'd found their bodies and we knew for sure that they weren't kidnapped. So I don't know how that whole rape thing ended up in both Glenn Beck's and Ben Shapiro's stories, but I was a little disappointed at the misinformation there. And I wish that they'd go back and correct that, correct the story. Um, anyways, as it just, anyways, it just, it goes on and on and it really, really is disappointing um, just how, just how badly the media doesn't care about facts or the truth. In fact, not only do they bring in things that have zero relevance to slander, but they also take out things that do matter. They take out people's commentary that they do want to be heard. Now, what do you mean by that? I'm talking about guns. Most, I, I want to say all, but then, you know, there's probably one oddball who doesn't. But I would say 99% of my relatives, family members, extended family were very strong Second Amendment supporters very patriotic, very conservative, okay? And I had, on, on the day after the attack, on Tuesday, I had four separate interviews with four different local news stations in my, in my state of Florida where I live today, and every one of them asked me that closing end question, what do you want what do you want to the American people to know about the situation? What do you want, you know, what do you want people to know? And every single time in every one of those four interviews, do you know what I said? I said, it is very important. It is crucially important that we hold on to our guns, that we protect our Second Amendment rights. And it is so important that we as Americans look at Mexico, look at how their gun control has hurt their country, has hurt their citizens, has hurt American citizens now, and the cartels have all this weaponry, this illegal weaponry. If you have gun laws, the only people that it's going to, to help are the bad guys. Because those gun laws make it so that all the law-abiding people, all the people who are not going to go killing and murdering and stealing, all those people are going to, for the most part, abide and not have guns, or that's the theory, and, or, or can't get a gun unless they get it illegally somehow. And all the cartels will totally have all the guns. So literally, gun control laws only hurt the innocent, okay? Now, that's what I said in every one of those four interviews. Guess how many of those news stations allowed any kind of comments about guns? Guess. You guessed it. Zero. Absolutely zero out of four stations at any of my commentary that was my main point is we need to protect our families. We need to protect our country and prevent our country from becoming like Mexico where you can't have safety for your women and children because of gun laws. None of them covered that. In fact, three of them just ignored my comments and then didn't publish them and made sure that they were cut out of my interviews. And the fourth one and the last one that I did that day went so far as to literally chuckle after I said that and said, now you can't, and I'm paraphrasing because I didn't write it down or anything. It's not recorded on my, I don't have recording, copy of recording that is, but it said something to like, now you can't say something that crazy and patriotic and get people all stirred up. Like you can't, you can't do that. Like what, what? You're saying that patriotism and protecting your families with guns and the right to defend yourself is bad? You can't say that? 
Oh, and of course, he did not include that in any of my interview. In fact, I just have a general disgust for the media at this point because one of those interviews that was done was turned out as a total, yeah, I did not like the way it turned out. It was really just sad and it looked really bad. And it's not, he, he started taking random stuff that I thought was after our interview and then he made it the focus of our interview when I thought we were just talking off the record and he made it like the entire interview it was really gross I just did not like the way it turned out and it was just the media they create the narrative they create the story they create this is what we want this story to be and then they interview you or they take your story and then they just take enough little out of context words of yours and fit it into their story so it looks like you're condoning their story so I want you to, your takeaway from this is the media lies, they lie through their rotten teeth, they have their own narrative, and they fit you into it whether you want to be fit into it or not, okay? Now, one thing that I do love is that exactly that I found so far, exactly one person has been able to voice exactly what I voiced four times on four different interviews on Tuesday, and that is one of my cousins, Kendra Miller, and she was on, on Anderson Cooper's um on his show and I'll play a little recording of it because I love even just her voice inflection and the way she said it, it was just so simple and humble and so perfect and it just cut because Anderson Cooper is a raging liberal and he's not a huge gun supporter okay but she literally she said it in like the most just almost casual but like passionate way and she wasn't like because she didn't she probably really didn't know where Anderson Cooper stood on this but she literally said on a, an interview with Anderson Cooper, and I think the reason why this was able to fly and was not cut out, even though Anderson Cooper is, is crazy liberal, is because this was a whole interview. It was a whole 20 minute interview. It wasn't like uh, little bits and pieces here. Like they tell their story, add your voice for one little second and cut you off. No, it was a whole interview, which was golden. And Kendra did a fantastic job. Anderson, just like every other news reporter, asked her, What's, what do you want the American people essentially to know? or something like that. And she said, I don't know where you're standing on the whole trying to take away guns in America right now, but I say fight for those guns, Kendra said. She, um, then she said, the things are happening here in Mexico. Okay, these things are happening here in Mexico because people can't protect themselves by law because they're not allowed to own these guns. Since the government isn't doing their job of protecting of protection in the way that they should, these cartels think they can wreak havoc and the people are left defenseless. So I say, hold on to your guns, people. And it's not just us. Um, she actually said this earlier. She said the controlled car con uncontrolled cartels are causing tremendous suffering. There were two people who went missing and we haven't heard of their whereabouts from a community about 10 minutes away from us, she said. And the people that have been involved and worked for us, not those two specifically, but families of, and what's happening here is the Mexican people are oppressed. They're being abused by the cartels, living in fear for their lives. We can't drive public roads safely. We're being threatened that we can't even take some public roads or else we'll have bad things happen to us. But it's not just my community, it's all of Mexico. So many people are not protected the way they should be. Go Kendra, holy cow, I was so proud of you when I watched this. I'm literally just, I mean, I loved watching, I know this is probably bad, but I loved watching Anderson Cooper's face because here he is, a man who would argue probably hardcore and probably has, I just need to look up clips, but I didn't, I, I kind of ran out of time, but arguing hardcore for gun control, liberal policies. And here's Kendra, her family has just been victimized by the drug cartels and has been the victim of living in a country with with strong gun control laws that the US, United States leftists would love Mexico gun control laws. But look at what it's doing to Mexico, and that's exactly what Kendra pointed out. I'm gonna play this little audio clip, and then um, we'll sum up with uh, rapid fire question answering. I don't know where you're standing on the whole people trying to take away the guns in America right now, but um, I say fight for those guns because oh, the, these things are happening here in Mexico because the people can't protect themselves because by law they're not allowed to own these guns. And so um, since the government isn't doing their job of protection in the way that they should, these cartels can just wreak havoc and the people are less defenseless. Mm. And so I say hold, hold on to your guns, people. <laughs> All right, so that's that clip. I'm so proud of you, Kendra. Thank you so much just for saying that, um, for doing that live interview, for saying what the rest of us have been wanting to say and been wanting the media and wanting the American people to know. Um, I'm just, I'm really proud of you and also just for being so brave.
for being so brave in this awful tragedy when it's your immediate family. So I'm gonna go ahead and end really quickly with Q&A. Uh, this is rapid fire. I've answered most of them. So some of these might be slight repeats, but just for the many, many, many people who have been asking. So um, I haven't even put, bothered to put names. I just copied your questions directly. So it says, why are people saying they're tied to Nixvim? I don't even know that's how you say it, just so you know. It's N-X-I-V-M. It's all in caps. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I don't know why people are saying it. Actually, I do. The media likes to sensationalize things, but trust me, we're not tied to it at all. This is ridiculous, and it's just a lie. Um, did the police catch the criminals? No, they didn't. Mexico tried to cover up if, from their embarrassment and say that they did for about a day. Nobody believed it, saw right through it, and no, the Mexican government was wrong, and no, the police have not caught the criminals, and quite frankly, I know this sounds awful, but that's why people are moving. If people don't expect justice. This is a Mexican government. It's corrupt from the inside out. There's probably not going to be justice. Oh, and I do want to actually say just because this is something I didn't cover, um, but a lot of people have been reading stories about some cousins of mine who were murdered by the cartels about roughly around 10 years ago. Um, yeah, that was a story as well. Um, at that point, um, without it's a long story, but basically the cartels did kidnap, hold for ransom a couple of cousins of mine. When we refused to pay the ransom, they released them and they later came back in retaliation and killed two of my cousins. Um, and beat them um they and there were signs of torture so that's another story um but it's not directly related to this that was in five miles away in colonial baron and it was a different circumstance um another question is why were they targeted man i wish i knew why trust me the whole family wants to know why we don't know we don't know um, why did they live in Mexico? Um, because that's where our ancestors, however many generations back, moved to Mexico. And, you know, obviously it was originally, originally, yes, the colonies were settled because some of our ancestors wanted to live um, and they wanted freedom of religion. They wanted to live polygamy and that wasn't allowed in the United States. So they moved to Mexico. Yes, that is the founding. But who the heck in the media thinks it's okay? Anytime anything random happens, why do they bring in founders from however long ago to talk about the founding of, of the colony. Nobody cares. That's not related to what's going on right here, right now to these innocent victims. Have the suffering members moved out of there? Yes, many, many have. It looks like a ghost town is what I'm hearing. In fact, I'll, um, right here, just a minute ago, I'll post maybe like side by side, I'll post a picture what some of those caravans look like leaving. Why do these families choose to live in Mexico and not the United States? Because this is their home. This is where they've been born and raised. They have big, beautiful farms here. They have pomegranate, you know, farms. They have, you know, pomegranate, or yeah, pistachio, or not pistachio, um, pecan orchards. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of time and investment and money to grow a farm, to grow an orchard. You can't just abandon it. Um, so yeah, that's why they're living there. It's just where their home is. A lot of them live part-time too. They'll live like part-time Mexico and part-time United States. My grandma did that for a long time. She had a home in Mexico and would go down there sometime and she would live in the United States for some time. She sold her home a while back, but um, how are you related to them? Like I said, uh, Ronita is my second cousin and the other two women are my cousins through marriage. What makes this a LeBaron attack? It happened in Labora. Uh, this is actually posted by a family member. She's making a very good point. This is not a LeBaron attack. No one had the last name of LeBaron. They were Millers, Johnsons, and Langfords. And also, it didn't happen in Colonial LeBaron. It happened in La Mora. So that's the answer to that. How are the kids doing? I'll give you an update on that in just... Oh, actually, I just gave you an update on that. Um, basically, they're doing better. Um, just extra praise for, prayers for Cody and his shattered jaw that's, um, that's been sewn shut. Um, why didn't they get buried back in Utah, but in Mexico, I wouldn't ever want to be there because this is their home. This is their heritage. A lot of people have been, you know, born here and lived here. I myself was born there. They want to be where their family members are, um, and where their other family are buried. Um, so yeah, this is their home. That's why they're buried there. Were the families ambushed close together or were they in very different locations? I talked about this earlier, but Ronita and her four kids were in one spot and then about eight. 10, roughly around 10 miles ahead were the other two vehicles close together. Um, what is the LeBaron family? Well, a bunch of people who share the last name LeBaron or are related to LeBarons. Do you think Trump should, sh should send the U.S. military in response to this brutal attack? 
I would have liked to see that personally, um, but that won't happen. The Mexican president said no. And also at this point, a lot of the evidence has been discarded, destroyed, or not properly collected. So I don't even know that there's much the US military or FBI could do at this point. Um, a week ago, that would have been great though. Um, why did they, why did one car stay there and get burned and the others not? We wish we knew. Trust me, I wish I knew. I don't know. And nobody knows. We don't know. We don't know why they burned one and not the other. Um, were there deaths in retaliation to members being associated or affiliated with the cartel? I answered that earlier. Absolutely not. They are not associated in any way, shape, or form. Um, a little situation of how your family first started there. I kind of gave that briefly, but maybe I'll do that on a different episode um, for those who want to know. But I do have, to, I cannot stress this enough. Original history of how my family first got down there in that colony has nothing to do with the people today. And it's nothing to do with this tragedy. It's just unfortunate the media have tried to dig up this dirt and, and create this victim blaming mentality. Why do they stay in a place where they can't protect their families? Well, because they didn't know that this was going to happen. This was very surprising, very unprecedented. They've lived there for, you know, 50 plus years and this has not happened. So they didn't know that this was going to happen. And also, why does anyone live in New York or Chicago? Okay, it's super dangerous there and you're really not, you don't have a lot of protection either. Um, although I will say more than Mexico, obviously. Is Mexico gonna just ignore this since the cartel fills their filthy pockets? I don't know, but probably, if I had to guess, probably. Is it true that this was a re revenge attack? Nope, that is not true. There was no revenge to be had. I don't know why anyone would call it a revenge attack. There was, I don't, I don't, I don't understand that. Is this a case of mistaken identity or, identity or were they targeted on purpose? Um, at first we thought the media was reporting it was a mistaken identity, but the family knows um, that they don't think that this was a mistaken identity. But the fact that Christina, I mean, none of these are tinted windows or anything. Christina got out and waved her arms, tried to get them to stop. Um, the truth is, is we, we don't know, but it looks more like targeting than mistaken identity, especially because it wasn't a crossfire, it was one side. Um, can you set everyone straight on the allegations of polygamy and the ties to Epstein? Yeah, I did. We have nothing to do with Epstein, no ties to a sex cult. Yes, some of our ancestors practiced polygamy, but who and who, I'm sorry, but there are so many Mormons and so, so many Mormons in Utah whose family practiced polygamy a couple generations ago. Why is it that we don't, I mean, people don't go around digging that up every single time something happens. What about the descendants? Yeah, don't get me started. I just, it makes me really angry. This doesn't have anything, anything to do with the tragedy that's happened. What is your relationship to the LeBaron family? My last, my maiden name, my maiden last name is LeBaron. That's my relationship. Um, why does the media keep headlining them as Mormons instead of Americans? I wish I knew. I think the media, um, they're just playing on the American peoples and even like the world's curiosity and anything to do with polygamy or Mormonism piques people's interest. And so they drag that in as much as they can, even when it's not particularly relevant. Um, do they travel? travel back and forth to Mexico a lot. Was this road familiar? Yes and yes. They do travel back and forth a lot and the road was familiar. What part of Mexico did this happen? It happened in La Mora, Mexico in the state of Sonora. Are the survivors going to stay and live life in Mexico? Um, it looks like a lot of them or most of them are not going to. That's all I can do. This is, like I said, a very, very long episode. Um, not really in the mood for good in the world, but I guess the only good that I can pull out of this is that prayers do matter and eight, by the grace of God, eight beautiful children, seven of Donna's and one of Christina's survived this tragedy. And I would just pray, just please pray for their families and for little Cody. They are just in a world of pain and hurt. You've got motherless children and widowed husbands. Um, there's just a lot of prayers needed. Um, at the end of all of this, if you do want to give, there is a GoFundMe um, that is available. I will post the link. Um, one thing that I think is really sickening, and I, I wasn't really planning on bringing this up, but it really just made me sick. And I just, I, I'm not really into publicly shaming people, but this made me, this lady who messaged me on Instagram, she made me so angry that I kind of want to publicly shame her and you know what I'm not going to use her name because I'm not going to go that far but she makes me super freaking mad she messaged me on Thursday and I really want to give away her username because that made me so mad but I'm not going to I'm gonna hold myself back and restrain myself so she said can you please tell me if the families involved in this horrible ambush are polygamists 
And then she said, are the adults involved in plural marriage? And I said, why do you ask? And she says, I asked because I was considering donating to the GoFundMe, but I could not in good conscience give money to people living a lifestyle that the Bible calls sin. I'm assuming by your evasiveness that the answer is yes. Thanks for your time. I'm truly sorry for your family's loss. I hope that every person responsible is held ac accountable. You know what? Gross. And shame on you, lady I'm not going to name. Shame on you. How dare you? All I have to say, I, I replied, and this is what I said in doubt, and I will expand on this, but this is what I replied to her. I said, my family has a history of this practice from 50 years ago and beyond, but this is what I put, and most do not practice that lifestyle today. Also, no one said you have to give money, but that is really judgmental and horrible and a horrible reason to withhold help. Every person on this earth does something that, quote, the Bible calls sin, unquote, and that includes you, ma'am. That, oh, does that mean that no one should ever help you in the time of tragedy because you are a sinful woman? And that is exactly what I have to say. This pious, no, not even pious, that's the wrong word, this Goody two shoes, nose in the air, holier than thou attitude from this woman. Ugh, I can't give, I can't help. I can't help this family because they're living in what the Bible calls sin. Yeah, guess what? Polygamy might be a sin, but so is lying, so is stealing, so is um, coveting, so is adultery. There are so many sins and I can guarantee you that you're guilty of at least, at least one of them. And are you saying that we should never, ever, ever help you in a time of crisis because you are a sinning, you are a sinful woman, don't you know? You do things that the Bible says are a sin. No, that's disgusting and honestly an unchristian attitude. And I'm going to turn it around. I think homosexuality is a sin too. I really do. But you know what? When that gay bar was shot up and all those gay individuals were killed did I did I put my nose up or did you put your nose up and be like well serves them right I'm not gonna help them or their families or like give comfort or aid or anything because they're living up you know they're living in sin like you know what that's where mercy and grace comes in God's the one who condemns not you and you know what no one said you have to give no one said you have to to help these families no one's in any way saying that you have to do that but to, to, to say that I was going to, but not going to, because I'm better than that person. Because, you know, like, if this is my family, you should totally help me because, like, I'm so good and perfect. But, like, someone else? No. No. I'm sorry. No. And I really i am so tempted to share this person's username because I'm getting that furious. I don't even know why. Other people said awful things about my family, and I just didn't really care that much. But this woman and just her holier than that, thou attitude like I'm a better Christian I'm a good person I was like huh, okay then all right then you go forward with that prideful attitude we'll see how far that takes you in life anyways sorry I try to end with good in the world the good in the world is by the grace of God by prayer and God's protection eight beautiful babies survived pray for their pray for their families God bless the Millers God bless the Johnsons God bless the Langfords and all of their many family grieving. God bless America and God bless my birth country, Mexico.